when humankind comes together to solve complex problems. The result is nothing short of a miracle. The miracle sometimes manifests itself in an underwater sea tunnel and sometimes high up in space as the man-made International Space Station. Welcome to The Why in History. I am Ajay Kaul and today we look at some of the magnificent engineering marvels built by humans in modern times. When Samuel Morse sent the world's first telegraphic message, What Hath God Wrought? from Washington DC to Baltimore, In 1844, the United States and Great Britain set out to lay a transatlantic cable to ensure telegraphic messages could be transmitted over the Atlantic to have communication link between the United States and the European continent. Now, with the advent of telegraph, messages could be delivered domestically within the short amount of time But the key challenge in front of the engineers and the scientists was to be able to deliver the message by cable over the Atlantic Ocean so the recipient could receive it within hours instead of days. So in 1856, an American investor and two British engineers formed the Atlantic Telegraph Company with funding from the governments of both the United States and UK. And in August of 1857, two ships, the HMS Agamemnon and the USS Niagara, set out from Valencia, Ireland, in the hopes of laying a cable that went all the way to Hearts Content, Newfoundland. The first few attempts at uh, laying the cable in the Atlantic were not successful because the cable ended up getting damaged. And it was only the third attempt that the Agamemnon and the Niagara decided to meet in the middle of the Atlantic and then set out in opposite directions to lay the cable. And finally, in early August 1858, the ships arrived at their respective destinations in Ireland and Newfoundland, Canada. And on August 16, 1858, Britain sent the United States an inaugural message via the freshly laid transatlantic telegraph cable. And in it, Queen Victoria congratulated President James Buchanan on their country's mutual success at building the very cable she was using to talk to him. This was a huge milestone and a highly publicized event. Unfortunately, just a few weeks later, the cable stopped working. Now, between 1860 and 1865, the United States was in the midst of its civil war. So the interest in the transatlantic cable was not that high. On the contrary, the British government was still interested in laying another transatlantic cable partly because the British Empire had colonized many islands in the Caribbean. There were also a lot of lessons learned in the first few attempts to egg the engineers on to get to the final successful laying of the cable. And it started with using a totally different ship, the SS Great Eastern, for laying the cable. And the ship was about 700 feet long and displaced 22,500 tons. But the most tricky problem to solve was managing the cable and rolling it out smoothly with proper tension so it would not snap with the ship's motion and the ocean um, waves. The cable was made of seven strands of copper wire twisted to make a core about 0.083 inches in diameter. With each successive attempt, the cable was improved and strengthened And the last successful run used the copper core with seven strands, but it was three times heavier overall. The copper core 
was covered with three separate layers of processed gutta percha which is a latex like secretion from tropical trees and this in turn was covered by hemp saturated with a mix of tar pitch and linseed oil the copper core in the final attempt was more highly refined and purified to ensure good and consistent conductivity and the layers of gutta percha were supplemented with intermediate layers of an insulating compound the cladding too was galvanized to inhibit rust and corrosion the only way to test the cable's integrity both at manufacturing and after its underwater placement was to send a pulse down the cable and look for a minuscule output at the far end and here is where one of the engineers on the project lord kelvin came up with a highly sensitive galvanometer that would visibly indicate if a tiny current flow existed and which would mean that the cable was intact and it was in 1866 that the first successful connection which was also consistent was established between north america and europe it was expensive to transmit a message um the rate being a dollar per letter in an era when a working man's pay was just a few dollars per week but this deployment took the world into a new era of intercontinental communication within a few years of its success additional transatlantic cables were deployed and operated on parallel submarine routes but what stands out in this initiative is the vision commitment and persistence shown by a private investor group despite several costly and frustrating failures and that too in the middle of the 19th century in 1802 albert mateo favier a french mining engineer put forth a proposal to tunnel under the english channel with illumination from oil lamps or strong coaches and an artificial island positioned mid channel for changing horses he envisaged a bored two level tunnel with the top tunnel used for transport and the bottom one for groundwater flows over the course of the 19th century several proposals were placed to connect the british isles to mainland europe but to put the idea into action there were several obstacles and one of the prominent one being why on earth would you connect the united kingdom to its arch enemy but in 1866 henry mark brunel made a survey of the floor of the strait of dover and his results proved that the floor was composed of chalk which meant that a tunnel could be dug through this layer which was essentially an underwater passage the only problem was that it would be twice the length of any existing tunnel this idea though caught the fancy of a lot of people but then europe got engulfed in two world wars and the economic benefits of the tunnel took a back seat for some time and it was only in 1981 after the conservatives came to power in the united kingdom that british pm margaret thatcher and french president francois mitterrand agreed to establish a working group to evaluate a privately funded project for the tunnel in 1981 and subsequently on february the 12th 1986 the treaty of canterbury was signed by british pm margaret thatcher British Foreign Secretary Sir Geoffrey Howe, French President François Mitterrand, and French Minister of Foreign Affairs Roland Dumas. The treaty gave the go-ahead to the Channel Tunnel project. A group of French and British companies invested a modern-day equivalent of about 14 billion British pounds, making it the most expensive project at that time. 
The design consisted of constructing three separate tunnels. One for trains going to the United Kingdom. The second for trains going to France. And a service tunnel in between them. The service tunnel had crossover chambers, emergency passages and air ducts. And its primary purpose was maintenance and emergency operations during a disaster or an emergency. In 1988, workers began excavating from both sides with a plan of meeting in the middle. There were a lot of fissures and fault lines and that led to water seepage during the boring process. Since it would impact the boring process, the leaks were sealed using grout. Essentially, to ensure that the chalk layer was dry, an engineer used to work ahead of the boring machine and reinforce the chalk about to be drilled with grout to seal all the seepage. In all, 11 tunnel boring machines were used, 5 on the French side and 6 on the UK side. The tunnel boring machines weighed about 1300 tons and drilled nearly at 3.5 meters per hour. And as they dug through the tunnel, the boring machines installed lining rings to stabilize the tunnel behind them. To ensure that they were following the right trajectory to meet in the middle, the engineers on both sides employed satellite positioning systems to track their movements. After nearly two years of drilling, on December 1, 1990, the two ends of the tunnel finally met with Englishman Graham Fagg and Frenchman Philippe Cosette crossing over from either side and exchanging a Paddington Bear soft toy. Laying off hundreds of miles of rail tracks, cables and sensors took another three and a half years and it was on May 6, 1994, that the tunnel was formally opened to the public by Queen Elizabeth II and French President Francois Mitterrand. On an average, 60,000 passengers pass through the tunnel every day, along with 4,600 trucks, 140 coaches, and 7,300 cars. And on Valentine's Day, Around 12 million roses are delivered through the tunnel every year. In January of 1984, President Ronald Reagan instructed NASA to construct an international space station for the purpose of space research on a global footing. And what came out of that direction was the single biggest human-made structure ever launched into space, which was funded by 15 different countries. The International Space Station was constructed over a period of 10 years with the help of more than 30 space flights. It is the product of unparalleled scientific and engineering collaboration between five space agencies from 15 different countries. The primary partners are NASA, Russia's Roscosmos, the European Space Agency, and besides them, other partners include the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. The space station orbits the Earth at the height of 248 miles, or 400 kilometers, and it spans the globe every 90 minutes at a speed of around 17,500 miles per hour, or 28,000 kilometers per hour. Roughly, the station covers the distance between the Earth and the Moon in a single day. The most amazing fact about the International Space Station is that it was assembled in space. It comprises about 14 primary modules, and most of these were delivered via launch vehicles and assembled in space. In November of 1998, the first segment of the ISS was launched, which was the Zarya control module from the Russian Proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. 
uh, the Zarya supplied fuel storage, battery power, and rendezvous and docking capability for Soyuz and Progress space vehicles. And just a few weeks later, the Unity module from the United States was launched for the International Space Station um, during the STS-88 mission. And joining Unity with the Zarya module was the first step in the assembly of the International Space Station. The International Space Station, or the ISS, can be divided into two main parts, the habitable modules and the solar and radiator arrays. And both of these required an incredible amount of design and engineering. Towards maintaining an uninterrupted supply of power to the space station, the engineers had to figure out how to maximize the power from the sun. And this was achieved by having the solar panels turn to nearly always face the sun. And this ensured an uninterrupted power supply to the ISS. From a cooling perspective, there are three forms of cooling in the space station. Radiators that release the heat, air conditioning, and reflective paneling. The reflective paneling reflects heat away from the station. The air conditioning circulates air inside the station, whereas the radiators draw heat out of the space station to keep it cool. And this is important to maintain a very optimal temperature within the space station for the astronauts and also for the experiments that they conduct. The ISS has multiple robotic systems in place, which range from robots that allow the solar panels to always face the sun, to the Canada Arm 2 that helps dock spacecraft. None of the US spacecraft that currently go to the ISS have automatic docking, which means that they have to basically park in front of the station and wait for a robotic arm to latch on and guide the spacecraft to dock with the station. Besides docking, the robotics on the ISS enable several tasks, which include spacewalks, set repairs, and also handling and movement of various objects around the space station. As of May 2022, about 258 astronauts and researchers from 20 countries have visited the ISS. The top participating countries include the US, which has had 158 people visit, and Russia with 54 people. The astronaut and research time on the space station are allowed to space agencies according to how much money or resources they contribute. The engineering marvels we have talked about so far were creative solutions to a few engineering problems and took humankind to the next level of innovation and development. But the next engineering marvel we talk about ensured the survival of an entire nation. With parts of the country lying below sea level, the Netherlands constructed a system of floodgates, storm surge barriers, and dams to contain storm surges from the North Sea and prevent it from washing away the entire country. In January of 1953, a heavy sea storm pounded the coast of Zealand that weakened the dikes that had been built to protect the region from flooding. These dikes got weakened, drenched with water, and ultimately gave way, flooding several areas in the region, leading to about 1,800 plus fatalities, 100,000 evacuees, and 200,000 hectares of land under water. This disaster led to the creation of the Delta Commission, which came up with the Delta Plan in 1958, which laid the foundation of the Delta Works project to prevent future flooding across the Netherlands. A total of 13 dams, including four barrier and nine secondary dams, were built to close off the mouths and inner reaches of the broad, long and interconnected inlets that for centuries had exposed the region to the North Sea. So by 
Closing out the inlets for the North Sea, the Dutch vulnerable coastline was reduced by 700 kilometers or 435 miles, which drastically reduced the length of the dikes exposed to the sea. The last barrier dam to be completed was the Oosterschelde Dam, which stretches across the three channels of the Eastern Shelter, and it consists of several strings of gates and their supporting piers, and totals about 2.8 kilometers, or 1.75 meters in length. The interesting feature here is that it has adjustable gates that in normal weather allow the seawater to ebb and flow into the Osterschelde estuary, which benefits the fish and the bird life in the region. But during severe storm, the gates can be dropped to keep out the high tides and storm surges from inland. The big ingenuity displayed by the Dutch was that new roadways and connecting bridges were built over several of these dams and dikes, which ended up connecting areas that had historically been isolated from the rest of the Netherlands. The Delta Works system is indeed a very creative and outstanding execution of civil engineering principles to keep flooding at bay from a vulnerable region. In fact, the flooding of New Orleans in 2005 occurred for many of the same reasons as the 1953 flooding in the Netherlands. Poorly maintained levees broke well below their design tolerance, allowing the city to be flooded within five hours. Had New Orleans taken a page from the playbook of the Netherlands Delta Work system, the length of the defenses would have been reduced, preventing a lot of the catastrophic flooding in New Orleans. And it is on that note that we end this section of the program. On to the quiz section. Question from the previous episode. In May 1989, Iran filed a lawsuit against the United States at the International Court of Justice for the shooting down of Iran Air Flight 655. What was the final outcome of this lawsuit? The case dragged on in the International Court of Justice and in 1996, a settlement was reached where the United States expressed deep regret for shooting down of the Iran Air Flight 655 and agreed to pay $61.8 million to the victims' families and subsequently, Iran dropped the lawsuit. So the answer is C. The US agreed to pay $61.8 million to the victims' families. Question for the current episode. As a tribute to the greatest civil engineering achievements of the 20th century, the American Society of Civil Engineers has chosen the seven wonders of the modern world. Two of the wonders in this list were covered in today's episode. Which are those two? Are these A. The Channel Tunnel and the International Space Station? B. The Channel Tunnel and the Netherlands' Delta Works system, C, the Channel Tunnel, and the Transatlantic Cable, or D, the International Space Station, and the Transatlantic Cable. Once again, as a tribute to the greatest civil engineering achievements of the 20th century, the American Society of Civil Engineers chose the seven wonders of the modern world. Two of the wonders in that list were covered in today's episode. Which are those two? A. The Channel Tunnel and the International Space Station. B. The Channel Tunnel and the Netherlands' Delta Works system. C. The Channel Tunnel and the Transatlantic Cable. Or D. The International Space Station and the Transatlantic Cable. The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in today's episode. 
in the next episode, continuing to look at the new emerging multipolar world. We look at the new emerging manufacturing hubs across the globe, their strengths, their weaknesses, and the road ahead. Till then, stay safe and keep exploring the why in history.